All right, there we go. So um, let's get started. Um, again, uh, happy National Library Week 2022. And um, welcome to our program. Um, our presenter today is uh, JJC librarian Kamala Kaplan. Uh, she joined the library in 2018 as an adjunct. And since then, she has been involved in many projects at the library. She develops public programming, designs e-learning, teaches information literacy, and supports reference services. She completed her master's of library and information science degree at Dominican University in River Forest. And she is currently finishing up the master online teacher professional certificate from the University of Illinois at Springfield. When she isn't doing many library things, she's most likely on a culinary adventure or reading about one. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Kamala and take it away, Kamala. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Diana. Um, I appreciate you uh, being here to support me tonight. Um, so uh, before I begin, I just wanna thank you all for showing up at 7 p.m. on a Monday night to learn about the Pack Horse Librarians. Um, I know it's dinner time for many of you. So again, I really appreciate, appreciate your presence here and this evening. Um, and like Diana said, the J, uh, JJC Library is celebrating uh, National Library Week. And the theme this year is connecting with your library. So to, so, to celebrate National Library Week um, and show our appreciation for the inno innovative ways that libraries have connected with their communities, um, I would like to share a bit of history about a group of women called the Pack Horse Librarians. <clears throat> so historically, librarians have been an anchor in communities, um, connecting them to reading materials, services, and programs, and finding innovative ways to support their patrons in some of the most challenging circumstances. Not unlike librarians today, uh, the Pack Horse Librarians were instrumental in connecting with <clears throat> excuse me, with the rural communities of Eastern Kentucky during the Great Depression. So before we dive into the story of the Pack Horse Librarians, I think it's necessary to provide a bit of context to help you understand um, how and why the Pack Horse Library uh, project was established. So during the Great Depression, um, there were high rates of unemployment, leaving many Americans and industry struggling to survive. Uh, consequently, there was a deep feeling of hopelessness and despair in the country. Um, as seen here, bread lines as well as soup kitchens were sadly very common during this time. And homelessness rose during the Great Depression. And as a result, tent cities began popping up across the nation. Um, living during the Great Depression was a traumatic experience and many people lost hope during a very dark time. Uh, Kentucky, which was already one of the poorest states, was hit the hardest. Um, in response, the president, FDR, implemented the New Deal to create programs that were intended to help stabilize the U.S. economy and get people back to work. Um, included in the New Deal, um, but not as well known as other New Deal programs, was the Pack Horse Library Project. So there were a number of developments during the Great Depression that contributed to recognizing the need for a WPA program in the rural communities of Eastern, Eastern Kentucky. Um, Kamala, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we're not seeing the different slides that you have presented. And I know like that um, your slides are amazing. So I just wanna make sure we're, um, we're not missing out here. We've are got the- not are you not seeing now we it? now we're seeing the WPA's Pack Horse Library Project. Is that the slide you're on right now? Yeah. Did you see the okay. previous one? We did not. No, we didn't see the previous one. Okay. Um, well, we'll just move forward then. Um, all right, but you can see the uh, crack and hard times slide, correct? Yes, yeah, we see this. Thank you. There might be a delay, so just let me know. I'll just ask you as I move through uh, the slides. Um, so let me finish. So the 1930s uh, saw a decline in library extension services to remote mountain schools and residents. Um, most public libraries that were in larger cities relied heavily on philanthropy and donations. 
and had limited budgets, budgets to support services in remote areas. So um, as a result, 63% uh, of Kentucky residents didn't have access to public libraries. Um, a lot of people did not have access. And um, that was part of the reason why this, was, this program was so important. Um, the people in the remote mountain areas of Appalachia had up to this point survived on subsistence skills. So um, farming, weaving, canning, and so on. Um, that would have been um, a big part of their um, livelihood. And education was not a priority for mountain people. Um, and choices were made based on the needs of mountain living. Uh, Eastern Kentucky lagged far behind in education and infrastructure. And this was a region that was isolated and disconnected from the rest of the country. Uh, census data from the 1930s indicates that illiteracy was in the range of 19% to 31%, um, higher than the state's overall illiteracy rate, which was around 12.1%. Um, in addition to low rates of literacy, the Appalachian region had a 40% unemployment rate. Um, and this was much, much higher uh, than the national average at the time, which was 25%. So the New Deal programs like the WPA uh, were as mountain residents often referred to it, cracking hard times, which was their way of saying these programs were helping them improve their lives. So the WPA's Pack Horse Library project would go on to improve the lives of many rural communities in the Appalachian region, as well as improve the lives of women employed by the program. So the program served both the librarians and the communities they served. Can you see my screen and you, can you see my uh, slide with Eleanor Roosevelt? We're still seeing um, the cracking her times um, slide. You should, I think there's a delay. Okay, yep. now, now we're seeing it. Now we're, we see Eleanor. Okay. All right, so the first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, she believes strongly in improving the lives of women during the Great Depression. And in an effort to employ women, um, Eleanor Ro Roosevelt put her support into the Pack Horse Library Project. And she collaborated with a number of women in the Kentucky area who established the, the Pack, Pack Horse Library Project. Among them were Elizabeth Fullerton, who modeled the program on a, a very similar uh, traveling library um, from 1913. Um, Joanna Colcord, she was a pioneering social worker and a good friend to Eleanor Roosevelt. And then uh, Lena B. Nofsier, I believe is how it's pronounced, who was chair of the library services for the Kentucky uh, Parent, I'm sorry, Kentucky Congress of Parents and Teachers at that time. Um, collectively, these women's resources, connections, and tenacity would establish library extension services in the rural communities of Eastern Kentucky. So these are the key players <laughs> in getting uh, the Pack Horse Library program established. All right, can you see the employment slide? Yes, we're good. Great. All right, so. Um, the WPA established a specific set of employment criteria, um, and in order to apply for this position, you had to be a woman. So you had to be, to be, to be between the ages of 28 to 35, relatively healthy, married or single. Um, often these women were single and heads of their households, so they were the only providers. Um, there were a few exceptions, but generally most librarians were women. Um, and I think that may have had to do with um, a staff shortage. Um, and then these women were also, excuse me, these women also had to be locals. Um, they had to be familiar with the rural mountain communities and their culture. So in order for the Pack Horse Library Project to be successful, mountain people had to trust the, the librarians. Um, so that was really an essential part of um, making this uh, a successful um, a project. So there were roughly uh, 1,000 women uh, that were employed during the eight years of this program. Um, and somewhere around 200 were probably working at any given time. And uh, pack, pack horse librarians were paid about $28 per month. So today the equivalent would be about $540 per month. So pretty low wages. 
And the WPA paid for their income, but did not cover the cost of uh, renting a horse or for the food and boarding of their animals. So they also didn't pay for li library materials and the costs associated with running the libraries. Sounds familiar. <laughs> so of course, this didn't stop these librarians from finding creative solutions. Um, they were very tenacious, as you will soon learn. All right, do you see the next slide? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So the Pack Horse librarians were colloquially referred to as book women, um, but they were also called um, book ladies, roving librarians, <laughs> horseback librarians, carriers, and I would like to add uh, to these nicknames, uh, super heroines. Um, and in this image, a librarian is dropping off books at a rural school. Um, and this would have been a very special event as rural schools um, often did not have libraries or books for children to take home. So when I'm looking at this image, I, I, I can just hear these excited children, you know, like saying, hey, book woman, can I get a book, please? You know, and they're all surrounding this um, librarian. So it's a, it's a very, um, you know, heartwarming um, uh, image. And it really uh, tells the story, I think, of how important it was um, to have this service available in these com communities. Right, and so this is a photo of, um, a type of um, or an example of a pack horse library. Each county that participated in the pack horse library project had a designated center library, uh, which was often a house, um, a local school, a church, a private residence, um, or in this case, a, a storage shed. I believe that's what this is. Um, and they turned it into a library. So there were usually about five to six carriers. The head librarian was responsible for managing uh, their routes, um, cataloging materials, managing uh, circulation of materials, and repairing books. And sometimes this was a collaborative effort, um, and it depended on how many people were employed and what their needs were at the time. So as I mentioned, the WPA did not pay for library materials or overhead, so much of the funding came from, from donations and philanthropy. And unlike most WPA projects, the Pack Horse Library relied on cooperation um, from its communities, uh, philanthropy, and public interest uh, to fund its services and materials. So one of the program sponsors was the uh, Board of Education, and they agreed to pay for rent and utilities to operate the libraries on the condition that the librarians would also deliver reading materials to rural schools in Eastern Kentucky. All right, can you see Greasy Creek? Yes. <laughs> Sorry guys, you guys have a delay on, on your end. Um, all right, so the Pack Horse Librarians routes often require traveling over rough terrain um, through ravines, along cliffs and creeks to deliver materials to mountain people. And they rode in all kinds of weather, uh, snowstorms, um, rigid temperatures and, and blazing heat. Uh, these women were often riding solo, so they had to develop a keen sense of the terrain, weather and the um, local mountain people's temperament. Um, it was most definitely an adventurous job. And in this particular image, these librarians are riding through a muddy creek called Greasy Creek. Um, so um, when it rained, their horses would often have to swim through creeks. Um, so imagine being knee deep in mud, having to hold your feet out to the sides of your horse, and at the same time, trying to keep library materials in your saddle saddlebag safe from water damage. I mean, it's really incredible what these women did. Um, so, you know, try riding a mile in these women's boots. I mean, literally, this was extremely challenging uh, a job. So in this photo, um, a pack horse librarian is returning to a distribution center um, and she's filling up her saddlebag with uh, new reading materials. Uh, the lack of in infrastructure like paved roads and visible trails made their routes unpredictable and difficult to navigate. And typically the routes required them to travel about 18 to 20 miles per day. Um, and you can see in this photo, there's no visible trail. They're just 
you know, riding through hills here. Um, some of the stops on their route couldn't be accessed by horse, um, so they would be forced to leave their horse and walk to the patron's home. And in some cases, they even reached the destination by rowboat. Right, and this photo I think really doesn't need any words to convey how rough the carrier routes were. Um, I mean, just imagine riding through terrain like this in the rain of a muddy hill or in a snowstorm. I mean, these women were truly tough, resilient ladies. And so in, in this image, these pack horse librarians are attempting to cross foot logs very narrow foot logs to reach a distributing center. Um, and these were often used to build a passageway across a creek, um, but these passageways were not always available to librarians. And more often than not, the librarians had to travel by horse or mule through the creeks. Um, and I'm not really sure how sturdy that passageway was, but um, you know, based on this image, I'm, I question whether I would feel safe <laughs> walking across that. But, um, they did when it was available, um, but typically um, they were traveling by horse or, or mule. Um, the challenges that the pack horse librarians faced were uh, no small feat. Uh, remember the WPA only paid the librarian salaries and the librarians were responsible for paying for their animals and library materials. Um, however, they were tenacious and innovative and they found ways to get the horses and materials they needed. So librarians would often rent horses at a reduced rate from farmers who were out of work during the depression, um, which provided income for the farmers and reduced the cost of renting a horse. So it was a win-win situation for all. Um, while rough terrain and extreme weather were no doubt some of the biggest challenges um, for them, connecting with mountain people was possibly the more demanding part of their role. Um, historically, the attitudes of the mountain people were rooted in a culture of rugged independence and a deep distrust for government. So at the outset of the Pack Horse Library project, they were wary of outsiders coming into their communities. Um, yet, as you can see in this photo, the mountain people eventually came around, um, even asking to be read to, and this happened frequently. And as their trust grew, so did their requests. They often asked librarians to deliver um, messages to people in nearby towns and to pick up medicine and supplies to bring back on their carrier routes. Um, so they also created a communication system for these rural communities as well. Can you see the next uh, image? It should be a photo album cover. Um. Yes, it says WPA Packhorse Libraries. Yeah, so, okay. I know it's kind of hard to read, so I'm going to read it to you guys. Um, and I found this in my research um, when I was exploring various archives, and uh, and I think it's really telling of um, the Packhorse Librarian's commitment and tough character. So let me uh, let me read this to you. <clears throat> Sometimes the short way across is the hard way for horse and rider. But schedules have to be maintained if readers are not to be disappointed. Then too, after highways are left, there is little choice of roads. So clearly, no shortcuts for these ladies, right? This is truly a testament to their resilience. I was really in awe when I saw this. Um, I mean, the entire time I've done research on this, I've just been in awe of these women. Uh, so as the librarians' visits to uh, remote mountain communities became more accepted by mountain people, it was not uncommon to hear mountain people ask, hey, what's in that saddlebag, book woman? Um, for rural communities in the Appalachian region, reading materials had to be meaningful, and that is they had to have a practical purpose. Home health care, cooking recipes, canning, agriculture, and hunting were among the popular interests of mountain folk. So some of the popular books included Gulliver's Travels, Robinson Crusoe, as well as books by Charles Dickens and uh, Shakespeare. And of course, the Bible was also very popular. It was familiar to these rural communi communities and the teachings of the Bible had been passed down orally, um, or they had been memorized from hearing passages of the Bible in church sermons as well. 
So children's books were popular with the younger residents of rural Kentucky, but also proved to be quite popular with the adults whose limited uh, reading skills were more appropriate to this reading level. And while low literacy rates were the main reason adults couldn't read, there were many who simply couldn't because they lacked the means to purchase eyeglasses or were, vi or were visually impaired. Can you see the popular magazines? Yes. Great. So I thought you might be curious to see what they were reading. So as I mentioned earlier, reading materials had to have a practical meaning. Um, so Women's Home Companion and Popular Mechanics magazines um, circulated frequently, as well as the Ladies um, Home Journal. And so here are some images of the types of things that would have been of interest to them. So on one, on the left page, you can see that there are some quick recipes for um, canning and another um, article about um, that provides tips on um, how to end a cold quickly. So again, things that had practical meaning that would serve their immediate concerns uh, were valued in this community. Um, okay, so fun fact, um, beyond the demand for practical information, the residents of these communities were becoming curious about the outside world. So as literacy rates increased, so did their interest in the world outside of them. Um, they were very curious about the other, how the other half lived. Um, and they enjoyed reading magazines about fashion, high society, famous people. So not so different from today, right? So on the left, there's an article from Photo Play Magazine um, about glamorous women of the 1930s sharing their beauty secrets. And then you've got the Kardashians here uh, on the cover of Glamour doing uh, the very same thing. Um, and then I just took, I grabbed a quick uh, screenshot of, of uh, Kylie uh, sharing some beauty tips. So, um, you know, I just really wanted to, to show how how they, in many ways, they they shared some of the interests that um, you know some of our patrons uh, are interested in today as well. Um, so these kinds of magazines provided entertainment and escapism, and and were just as popular as our reading. Uh, materials do today. So another fun fact, uh, when reading materials were no longer appropriate for circulation, like dog-eared materials, librarians being the resourceful and innovative people they are, uh, reuse these materials for scrapbooks. Um, the librarians would cannibalize these beaten up books and magazines and repurpose the materials for scrapbooks. So in other instances, scrapbooks were constructed out of necessity as there simply weren't enough books to meet the increasing demand. Um, and then the scrapbooks quickly became just as popular as magazines and books. Um, and they included things that would, that would be of interest like recipes, uh, quilting patterns, colorful photos of animals, um, and images of fancy high fashion ladies as well. Um, and so these colorful images provided some entertainment fantasy, and also quite a bit of joy. Um, interestingly, in my research, I discovered that the mountain women also collaborate, collaborated in creating scrapbooks. So they often helped curate local recipes and quilting patterns that would be of interest to their community. So in 1936, uh, the first year of the Pack Horse Library Project, Center libraries were established in about six counties. And then by the second year, 1937, the project was quickly becoming popular. Um, the program expanded um, beyond the southeastern counties of Kentucky, um, establishing center libraries in 30 uh, counties. So in the second year, it was clear that the Pack Horse Library project was growing and quickly. As reading materials became more important to mountain communities, the demand for books and magazines increased. Um, libraries, librarians reported a shortage of materials at that time, but the Pack Horse libraries uh, lacked the funds to keep up with their patrons' demands. But to address the shortfall, uh, the Kentucky Parent Teacher Association implemented the fu uh, Penny Fund, which was a popular way of fundraising during this time uh, to help raise money for the additional materials. So they really um, helped keep it going. 
um, these fundraising events. Um, and then by 1939, uh, uh, 48 of Kentucky's 120 counties had established Pack Horse Libraries. So as you can see, the Pack Horse Library project expanded rapidly in its first, roughly its first four years. Sadly, uh, the Pack Horse Library project, project was shuttered in 1943, along with other WPA programs. And they managed, uh, they managed, however, to be one of the last uh, programs to be cut. So after the program was shuttered, uh, the majority of Eastern Kentucky would be without library extension services uh, well into the 1950s. So what happened to the librarians? Um, Well, many of the Pack Horse librarians returned to their farms. Um, some had been teachers um, and they returned to that profession and others con continued serving in public libraries. Um, and some also entered the defense industries as World War II took off. So the impact of the Pack Horse Library project was threefold. Um, first, it increased literacy in Eastern Kentucky making it easy for people to, in this area to learn new skills and find employment. Second, it not only served rural communities in Eastern Kentucky, but the program also helped employ women who very often were the heads of their households during the Great Depression. And third, it established a model for future bookmobiles. So today we can see the impact of uh, library extension services in communities throughout the U.S., right? So in particular, um, I'm talking about library bookmobiles. Um, during the pandemic, libraries demonstrated yet again that they could connect to their communities by responding to their needs in a variety of innovative ways, reimagining and adapting their services to help those in underserved communities. Uh, so from curbside delivery to delivering materials by trichedelic writer <laughs> and revamped school buses, and in some instances using drones to deliver books, um, libraries made it, librarians made an impact with their bookmobiles. So I think it's really important to remember that libraries are, are growing organisms and they're changing and adapting to best serve their communities. And whether delivering books by horse, wagon, or the newest technology like drones, libraries have and will continue to connect with their communities. But most importantly, they connect us to each other. And so that is the end of my presentation on the Pack Horse Librarians. But I just want uh, to send out a quick uh, shout out to all the librarians and library workers here tonight. Um, I appreciate you guys so much and we all work so hard. Um, so thank you for all you do. Can you see my screen for further reading? Yes, we see it. All right, so thanks again for joining me tonight. I hope I piqued your interest in the story of the Pack Horse Librarians. And I hope you will leave tonight wanting to learn a little bit more about these lovely ladies or super uh, heroines, as I call them. Um, and if you would like to read more about the Pack Horse Librarians, I recommend the following books. Um, um, we have these available at the JJC library. Um, I've, I've asked Dan Diana to send a link to you in the chat. Um, so you, it has a list of uh, different types of um, reading materials that I think um, might be of interest to you. So um, if you guys have any questions, my contact information is on that Google document. And um, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. So lastly, this is kind of informal. Um, but um, I would like to ask you guys a question. Um, I was, I'm just curious, I know we have a lot of, we have some LTA students, we have librarians, we have uh, library workers here. Um, I don't know everyone that's in the audience right now, but um, I'm just curious, what, what's, what are some of the things that we can learn from the Pack Horse librarians? What stood out to you? And I just want to mention, I think it's only going to be available to answer through the chat. I think we do have participants, um, cameras and audio off, if I'm not mistaken. So um, if you want to put in the chat your answer to this question, please do. Oh, OK, so the mics are off. That's right. I forgot.
Yep. <laughs> I need to stop whining too. <laughs> Yeah, I think that we're, yeah, you guys are saying some amazing things. This is so awesome. You know what, Kamala, I think we are going to go ahead and unmute so that way everyone can can kind of share. Yeah, so, let's um, do it. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay, can I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Is that okay? Yes, that sounds perfect. Um, Amy, are you able to go in and just change those settings for Diana so that way everyone can just kind of share um, I did. their videos yep. and audios? Yep. So people can feel free to um, unmute themselves or, you know, come on camera if they'd like. Well, I was going to say, I really like the connection you made to kind of like what we experienced with the pandemic and kind of being very innovative and still finding ways to connect to our communities and our patrons despite the challenges. And I really like that connection you made to what they were experiencing and just sort of like the creativity and perseverance that I think people in the library profession really, um, really have. Yeah, you know, I think we can all really identify, especially the last two years, because everything's, you know, it's not the Great Depression, it's not the same identical experience, but it's been very traumatic for people. And I mean, you know, the thing, the service that we provide is essential. And, you know, I, I, uh, one person mentioned that, you know, I, I need to stop whining when I'm having a bad day. And uh, that's, that's really what I got from this as well. And also just how important we are to our communities. You know? Anyone else want to share? I will. <laughs> I just, um, I saw a parallel between um, what the Pack Horse librarians as that um, idea of a service and bringing that service to their community and how once we were on lockdown, how librarians and libraries immediately got creative. We did um, curbside pickup, um, moved uh, reference services and um, uh, other services uh, programming to virtual. So it was just kind of like that creative library mindset of how we reach out to our communities and every, no community is the same, but they saw that need of we can bring, you know, books and reading materials to people who might not otherwise have easy access. So um, yay libraries. Awesome. Uh -oh. I'm the one who mentioned, I'm sorry about not whining at work. <laughs> um, I'm a librarian at Harper College. Hi, fellow Joliet Junior College librarians. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that there's days we know that we're frustrated with students or things happening on campus or whatever, a computer not working, whatever it is. Um, and we really have to think about, we have to count our blessings and, and look to those people. I'm sure they complain, but not, probably not as much as we do, right? They complain um, about dog ears. <laughs> yeah, that, that cracks me up. Like, let's, this book is done. Um, and I think the other thing is there's still, we forget there's still populations in our communities and in our country that don't have access. Um, I was looking through some small libraries recently um, at just out of curiosity at their spending budget, which there's libraries in the state of Illinois that don't have a budget, that don't, can't buy materials. And, you know, that I'm looking at their buildings because I'm curious and just seeing some communities that are still in, in need. So it's kind of not a lot has changed. No, it seems, it seems, it seems like it was just, it's, it's happening now, right? We are, we have the same issues today. Um, that they experienced then, right? And it's, yep. it's, um, it's part of, of librarianship, right? It's we're always assessing our community's needs um, and, you know, finding out like who, who isn't being helped, who is the underdog in the com community and how, how can we get those services to those mm -hmm. people, yeah. Well, also too, I thought um, Christine brought up um, a great um, point um, with with libraries and budgets, um, um, I also work at Rails. So um, so so looking at this from a statewide perspective, um, there are still, 
I don't remember the number, but there's there are still libraries in the state that I don't have an online catalog. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, Illinois is is um, you know unique in that um, sense where uh, I think the law needs to be changed, and we have people on our end that are really working to do that, but it's not always easy. So. Yeah, and I noticed some of them too, like they didn't have websites or Facebook was their website. Um, or just redirected me to some generic uh, website that had demographic information. And it is, it's unfortunate and it, there's no way it shouldn't be happening. And I, I look at our, our, you know, we have books and we're like, we need to get rid of these. We have too many books. Or I, I do book discussion with my people and they're like, what do you want this back? What do you want me to do with this? I'm like, ah, there's libraries that need those. So it's crazy. Yeah. I think it's also interesting to look at how the Pack Horse librarians provided so many community services. And we do that in our branches, right? We serve as gatekeepers and we make connections for people on the regular. And in their case, you know, whether they were delivering a message from one place to another, or whether they were sharing new educational materials or sharing quilting patterns from one community you know, area to another, um, they were still finding ways to do what's our bread and butter, you know, connecting community members and offering services or offering access to services that people otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, experience. So great presentation. Thank you so much. I really Thank learned you. a lot and enjoyed it. I think that the images really did tell such a deep story, you know, in addition to all of the, the um, facts and information you were able to share. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I, there were so many images that I found and so hard to, you know, to, you know omit some and keep others. Um, but I think these were really appropriate for the presentation and um, really on its own, it's just tells you what, like what, what the conditions were like for them, what kind of library buildings they were using, um, and how um, how difficult the terrain was. You know, I mean, and they they didn't go out every every day. By the way, I think they would go out every couple weeks or so. But there's no telling what the weather will be like. You know, and you, it's really hard to manage that kind of um, that kind of uh, weather and terrain. And so, um, I think that's what was so fascinating to me initially, but then when I learned more about, you know, the um, the different types of services that you were talking about, Deborah, like uh, they created a communication service in addition to um, delivering reading reading materials, and they were they provided entertainment, um, they gave joy to the community. I mean, they were just incredible people, and I aspire to be like them. <laughs> I wanted to say, um, this is Becky and I'm an LTA student and I actually have Amy Chilino and Amy Walker as my teachers this semester. Um, when I, uh, when you were talking about how it, when they were delivering books that, okay, well now we're going to be like someone said, delivering messages to the next town or delivering medicines. It reminded me of how I work in a public library that you don't know what patrons are going to ask you when they walk in the door, when they call, because we have to be ready for anything. And you're like, oh, I didn't sign up to, to deliver medicines, but I guess I'm going to, because this is, this is where I'm going. You know, like they just have to adapt and go with the flow. Anything, you know, to serve our community and other communities because they were traveling around. But, yeah, it is kind of, it's really, service can be fluid like that, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Thank you, Becky. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Anybody else want to contribute or share their thoughts? I thought, I thought it was, was a great presentation. Excuse me? Thought it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, hey, Susan. <laughs> How are you? Nice to see your face. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm glad you're here. I thought Eleanor Roosevelt's planning was exceptional because there were so many layers of people that were being helped. You know, she was bringing in women who oftentimes were single moms or the sole breadwinner. 
um, or contributing to try and make these low-income families survive, right? But in addition to giving them employment, it was also providing for patrons that were in need. You know, it was almost that, that pay it forward. Exactly. Yep. And backwards. You know what I mean? It, it just, I, I appreciate services that can be thought out to such depth so that, that there's winners all the way around, especially during the Great Depression when so many people were struggling on so many different levels. Yeah, and you know, I don't know the statistics on this, but I, I read that there were a lot of men that were abandoning their, their families at that time. Um, again, I don't have statistics, but um, enough so that it, it warranted um, employing women so they could take, take care of their families. Um, so that's an interesting aspect as well. It, you think, I don't think there are any other questions, no? Or comments? Great job, Kamal. Right. Thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. Really Thank fun you. to share this story with you. Thank it was you. nice to see some familiar faces and meet new people. Um, and this was my first time presenting online. So um, thank you again, because I had a little wobbly there, but um, 